about 23 years ago when it was time to move up here. At the beginning of the summer training in Los Angeles, we were asked if there was anything in particular that we wanted to study that summer. And one of the monks there said, it would be very useful to study Gestalt, which is a form of psychotherapy. And Buddhism has built within it a notion of uh, dealing with the mind, of course, because that's what Zen's about. And there's other meditation forms within Buddhism that deal with the mind. But Buddhism never really said we have a separate thing called psychology or psychiatry and then we also have this religious practice because really our religious practice is dealing with the mind. But um, that's, not the raw, that's not all there is to the practice of Buddhism. So some authors in the last few decades have separated this out and said, this is Buddhist psychology. Well, my teacher and this psychotherapist by the name of Ed Wartz, who passed away last year, taught a class together at the International Buddhist Meditation Center. Very successful, most successful continuing class they ever had. And my teacher would go and they would do meditation and then they would have this group psychotherapy where they practice gestalt. So <clears throat> one of the monks that lived there and who participated in this group said, it would be good if you, Edwards, could teach us a class on psychotherapy. And I thought that was pretty good because um, I didn't know anything about it. So we bought a book that was rather thick and Dr. Wartz started uh, the classes on our Thursday night uh, monks class because we used to have two classes during uh, the week during that summer training period or that rainy seasons. And um, I knew nothing about it. I read a little bit ahead in the book. Of course, I went to the bookstore and bought it. And, and um, I was trying to think, well, how will this help me help other people? Which is generally the idea behind studying something like that. So I, I basically asked a question like this. How will this help me help other people? And his response to me was, well, what do you want out of this study of Gestalt? What do you want? And um, that was a little off-putting at the time. It would probably be a little off-putting if I had that question asked in the manner he did because I didn't know how to answer him. Um, I stumbled around and I said, well, I want to be able to help people. Working on the assumption that people would come to me with problems. Now, at that time, in my practice and in my life, I had not had a lot of people come to me with problems. So I didn't have really a lot of examples to use. My primary function at that time was to teach people how to meditate. And, my, and then there was another primary function, although I always looked at that as the main thing I was doing, teaching people how to meditate. And my first teacher felt that any problem could be solved with meditation, which it can. But you have to have the willingness to throw yourself into the practice. And you have to have the willingness to let go of yourself in order for that to take place. And if you don't, if you need to talk to somebody, which a lot of people do, then what are we going to do? Well, Gestalt seemed like a good deal. Well, but I hadn't had a lot of experience with people coming to me and saying, oh, I feel like life is useless and blah, 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 blah. Well, I was kind of spoiled. And reflecting on it now, I realize I was kind of spoiled because most of the people that came to my temple in Long Beach were college students. And so college students have a particular way of approaching life. One is they realize it's beginning. And if anything, they're anxious to get it going. And so you don't get these desperate pleas for help because they're discouraged or they're getting to, end, to the end of life and they don't know what to make of it. They don't know what to do with it. So I just said, well, you know, to help people. I assumed that we were doing this class for, so that we'd be better at helping people because Buddhist monks, Buddhist priests, Buddhist ministers are like any other minister or priest. At times they have to listen to people and they have to help. Well, I, I was stuck 
when he said, well, what do you want out of it? Years later, I had occasion to be at events where Ed Wartz was the moderator, and he still asked the same question. Of course, by this time, I'd learned this was the standard gestalt question. What do you want out of it? Because people tend to see the world <clears throat> through their own eyes, and we all do it, and Zen recognizes that. Zen recognizes that the primary problem is that you see everything through your conditioning and your eyes and your uh, opinions come out of this kind of slanted, colored way of looking at things. And we also recognize that no matter how hard you try, you're always going to be seeing things through your eyes and through your experience. And so that very often when people ask questions like, what should I do? What they're really asking is, do you agree with me that I should do it the way I want to do it because this is my opinion? And I had the experience yesterday of spending the day with some pretty good friends who have had a pretty rough life. And they've had experiences that I haven't had. And of course, anytime someone has an experience that you, don't, you have not had, um, you really have to stretch to empathize with what's going on with them. Uh, not to feel sorry for them. It's easy for me to feel sorry, but to emphasize with the circumstances of their life that got them to this point. And uh, one of the things about these two, two people is that they both are divorced. This is their second marriage. Well, I can't, I have a hard time empathizing with that, having never experienced a second marriage. And the other thing is, is that these people both of them have a number of children and had really horrible experiences in relation to their children as far as losing, one of them losing her children uh, to her spouse. Um, and, and not a pleasant experience, not the thing where you go into court and the judge says, okay, the kids go with dad or the kids go with mom. And, and now dad or mom can visit them and have them for the summers. It wasn't that kind of nice, clean, it's in the movies experience where you watch this thing and the angst that people go through because they can't be with their children all the time. It wasn't nice like that. This was one of those things where, okay, everybody goes with, with dad and you don't get to see him. And you're a bad person to boot because dad told a whole bunch of lies. And so now we live with this situation for a long period. And, you know, come on. If this lady were to say to me, well, well, what should I do? How should I treat this? How should I react to this? And I were to say to her, as Ed Wartz would say, well, what do you want? She'd probably smack me. Because it's pretty obvious what she wants. And the dad in this marriage of two that are remarriages had his kids and raised his kids, all six of them. And from what I can tell, and this is a very subjective judgment, did the very best he could because he would work two or three jobs at a time to provide for those children and to try to make a life for them. And his second wife came in while there were still children in the house and she has remarked to me that he was very self-sacrificing, that he wore raggedy clothes and he didn't have much in the way of possessions because he was willing, when the kids needed anything, to give them whatever money they needed so that there was nothing left for him. And of course you can imagine in this second marriage when she said, no, this isn't right. You, when you go to work you should have a pair of pants that aren't stained and they're not frayed at the cuff. and all of this, so you can imagine some contention between her and the children came up, and the children, from the sounds of it, were doing a really good job of manipulating him, because that's what kids do. That's where we get our adults that manipulate people. They learn how to do it as kids, and nobody ever teaches them to stop manipulating people. So here's a couple, really nice couple, that love each other very much, that both have a history of pain. And to make matters worth, <clears throat> their children are old enough now that they have grandkids that they've never seen. And yet some of these children live within short distances. 
And we have all of this stuff. Think if you've ever watched a soap opera. We have all of that stuff. I now know where soap operas come from. I always thought that it just had to be somebody with not a very good imagination that came up with all the little problems in a soap opera. But no, it's all there. Think of, if you watch soap operas, think of all the little things that come in there, all the backbiting. Uh, one set of kids decided that <clears throat> dad was bad because he was no longer married to mom, so they're not going to talk to dad. And besides that, the woman he married now has to be the she-devil of the century because, okay, very convoluted, very complex. And so we're riding in this truck, and the person in the back seat says, this is the question that I get that I never quite can answer immediately. So what, how would Buddhists handle this? Well, that's, a, that's a, an extremely heavy question to me. Because unlike some teachers, I don't think that I know how all Buddhists would handle this. And <clears throat> I may have a pretty good idea of how the Buddha handled the situation if it was in the sutras. But the Buddha wasn't usually dealing with multiple wives and multiple husbands and kids that were estranged and all that. It was usually a little more basic and upfront. And so I get this question, well, how would the Buddha handle this? So, uh, as always, it kind of threw me for a loop. And what is the question really about? That's, that's the first thing. Well, the Buddha wouldn't have done a lot of talking, but what, what are we asking here? Is the question, how would the Buddha handle the pain that comes from not seeing your kids or not seeing your grandkids? Would the, how would the Buddha handle the anger uh, from having a spouse that, that told lies about you, that did everything they could to get your kids to hate, hate you, uh, that took advantage of you during the marriage? Two different things here, how to ha handle pain, how to handle anger. Are we asking the question, what would Buddhists do in the situations that I've sort of described? In other words, how would you react during the situation? Or how would you react after the situation? Or now that a lot of time has gone by, it's a pretty hard question to answer. And so I took the short way out and I turned and said, well, there are those Buddhists that feel that our enemies are our best teachers. Now, that might have been a Hallmark card answer. Because years ago, I read one of the Tibetan teachers, maybe the Dalai Lama, it doesn't matter who it was, made this statement, and then I kept seeing it reappear, that said, we learn the most from our enemies. And when I read that, being a Zen person and not a philosophical person, I started looking to see what I could do with that bit of wisdom or that bit of nonsense, because it could have been total hype. Just because one of these Tibetan monks said it doesn't mean it really meant anything. So I started looking at this idea that we learn the most from our enemies, <clears throat> which also includes those people that we don't like those people that make us uncomfortable, those people that won't give us what we want. I mean, when you say enemy, the Tibetans, they have this classic enemy thing. Even though the vast majority of the Tibetans living in India and Nepal today have no experience with the Chinese coming and taking their country. The vast majority of them were not born in Tibet. They're like Italians living in America that talk about the old country that were not born in the old country. The old country is a nice idea, but it really doesn't have a whole lot of anything to do with them. So, what can we learn from our enemies? Well, with Tibetans, of course, when the Dalai Lama says that, he was a young man when he left Tibet, and this was a wrenching experience, and he lost everything like any refugee would lose, like the Vietnamese that came here with the fall of Saigon. There was a lot lost, and there was an enormous amount of anger to lose your country, to lose your place, 
All you have to do is talk to any old Cuban and they'll express to you how much anger they have because they were forced out of their home. <clears throat> but that's not what most people experience. Most people have to deal with people that don't like them, people that won't let them have what they have, people that are unfair, uh, a world that's unfair, a judicial system that's unfair, a municipal system that's unfair, a neighbor that's not considerate. Well, those are our enemies. Those are the people that anger us. Those are the people that frustrate us. Those are the people that sometimes make us feel sad. Can they be our best teacher? Absolutely. One could say they're our only teacher. Because if you're around someone that agrees with you all the time, that's how we pick friends, of course, people that agree with us. And if you're around someone who indulges you and, uh, you know, if there's a choice, hey, let's go to the movies. What do you want to see? Well, I want to see this. Well, I want to see that. And you always give in or they always give in. So you always get what you want. Um, and there's never any contention. There's never any tension. There's never any arguing because they'll always go along with what you think. And by the way, we have a name for those people, our best friend. Yeah, they never challenge us. They never say to us, well, wait a minute, where did you get that idea? But the people that disagree with us, they challenge us all the time. And our normal response is to argue, is to fight, is to become angry, is to talk about injustice, is to do all these things to defend our personal opinion of what, whatever that's about. Well, all of those emotions that get ginned up when that happens, this was what the Buddha was about. This is the very core of not suffering. This is the very core of the world is suffering, of dukkha. Because when someone says no to you, you respond. And the Buddha would have you not respond. The Buddha would have you learn where those emotions were coming from and where that discontent was coming from and where that unhappiness was coming from. So when you come up against somebody that would not give you what you wanted or treated you poorly, the Buddha would say, ah, such an opportunity to understand yourself. And that's what I told them. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, I said, it gives you the opportunity to know yourself. Now, you have to understand, these friends are not Buddhist. And not only are they Buddhist, they really don't have any idea what a Buddhist is. So when they ask that question, it's very much as a tourist, you know, who really probably doesn't even have an idea of what I'm going to say. So they try to connect the lines. They try to get to something that's familiar to them. And the second person says, well, you know, yes, I've heard the idea that, you know, there are lessons in life we have to learn. Well, let me tell you something. That's not Buddhist. That's Hindu. And as warm and fuzzy as it feels, it's not Buddhist. And we have a whole group of religions that practice in this country today that fall under the title <laughs> New Age, that go out and borrow pieces from other religions. And this is not new, by the way. This started about 100 years ago. There's a whole bunch of these things that started up, like religious science. Church of Religious Science. They went out and they took what they saw to be the good. This one fellow did the good from these different religions and he put them together in an amalgam and he said, this is, we have taken the good from all religions and we're practicing a very good religion. And I wouldn't argue with that. But don't get confused about what Buddhism is. Buddhism isn't about somebody sitting up in the sky planning lessons for you on every life that you have because we believe in reincarnation. That's a Hindu notion. Just as it's a Hindu notion that when you die, you're going to go to some place. Every, all religions have these places you go, which in itself I find interesting. Where is this place you go? Where you walk in a room? I tried to read a book that I couldn't get through that had this idea. See, the Tibetans have this because they're very close to the Hindus. and. 
they have some ideas that have leaked in from the Hindu religion that they put incorporated in their Buddhism. And their Buddhism, you know, is the newest form of Buddhism, the Hindus, not the Hindus, but the Tibetans. It's a pretty new, pretty new stuff. And so they kind of took that idea, and that sounded good to them. Well, it fit in with the kind of religious beliefs they had before they were Buddhist. <clears throat> that you might go to a room and you might review your life. It's like, well, when you die, you'll review your life. You'll sit someplace in a room, in a space, and review your life. Kind of sounds logical if rebirth is about improving, that you would review your life, and then you make a decision about your next birth. And then after your decision about your next birth, you would come back as whatever you came back. If you came back as an animal, well, if you came back as a human being of low station in life so that you could learn humility, well, sounds very nice. Also sounds very, very created. People sat around and said, well, how would this happen? Well, if we all reviewed our life, why would we review our life after we died if we don't do it when we're alive? Think about it. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think the average person that's never heard of this notion of rebirth is going to sit in a room and review their life and say, hmm, I was bad there. I think I could set this up here. We have a wonderful opportunity to do it right here, to correct our mistakes and do it now. And that's what Buddhism is about. Buddhism is not about after you die, you can start fixing everything and make it, no, uh-uh. No, Buddhism is about right now, this moment, what's going on. Were you a little jerk yesterday to your friends? Were you mean, nasty, and awful? Were you selfish? Okay, well, now we have today. Guess what? New life, new day. You're still drawing breath. You did wake up this morning. Good time to review yesterday and feel a little remorse for the fact that you didn't do things right. And that might include going and apologizing to someone that you were a total snot to, or it might include buying a card and a little flower and sending it to the person, but it also might include changing the way you do things. Because we all know saying I'm sorry and continuing to do the same thing, that I sorry doesn't mean anything. Because people, our friends, our families, our spouses, our co-workers get really tired of people that keep saying I'm sorry and don't change their actions. In Buddhism, when it's about learning lessons, is about learning lessons and doing something about them right now. There's nothing to wait for. When you die and you're reborn, you haven't fixed the problem. If you perceive it as a problem, the problem needs to be fixed, if not exactly when it happens, shortly thereafter. So he said to me, well, I've heard, you know, well, there's a group called the Theosophical Society, and they really get into this idea. It's an amalgam of the way the Hindus look at things and the way the Buddhists look at things. And so it's very misleading for people because on one hand, you hear Buddhism and you go, well, I know what that is. That sounds familiar. And the next thing you're hearing all this kind of mystical stuff. Buddhists are not mystical, although we have mystics. And that in itself is a, a, a great discussion to have over cookies and tea for about five hours, what we mean by the word mystic. The great master Dogen was called the great mystic. And yet, he didn't have much in the way of visions. You know, he didn't talk to ghosts. He didn't do all this kind of stuff. Yet, he was a great mystic because he was a great practical person that taught everything was about this moment. Everything was about you personally disappearing so you could be free. So I'm sitting in this car and I say, well, it's about lessons, what you can learn about yourself and immediately before I got the about yourself out the response was well I've learned something 
I'm too trusting and I shouldn't let people, you know, I don't need to do that anymore. Boy, did they take advantage of me. I wouldn't call that a lesson that I'm too trusting. Years ago, someone said to me, you're too trusting. I went, okay. And I probably was. And they said, you shouldn't let people do this kind of stuff because they'll take advantage of you. I went, okay. You need to be tougher. You need to be more doubtful. You need to be more critical of people. Now, this was all in context to the temple and me and the people that came there. And I said, okay. And also to people in my everyday life. <clears throat> and standing there confronted with this person that cared about me very much who said that you let people take advantage of you. And I go, okay, I see that. I don't need to let people take advantage of me. And you are way too trusting and you expect people to be always good. And I went, yeah. And I thought about it. I reflected about it right at that moment. And my response is the same response I have now. Because I really didn't think about it. And every once in a while as I go through life and someone really takes advantage of me, I have to review whether I want to be taken advantage of. And my response was, I would rather go through life trusting people and be taken advantage of than not trusting anyone. And it's just that simple. Because I don't want to be a cynic. And I don't want to be a doubter. And I know there are bad people. And that does not mean that I walk down the street in Los Angeles, where the chances of getting mugged are very, very high, with a paper bag over my head pretending it can't happen. That isn't what it means. It means when somebody says, I will do this, I go, thank you. How wonderful that you would do this. And when they don't do it, I don't become a cynic. And when they don't do it, I don't take it personally. And when they don't do it, it's okay. Because when we're talking about anger and disappointment and frustration and hurt, you control that. You decide to get angry because it's righteous to get angry, because you have good reason to get angry, because it maybe makes you feel alive to get angry, and you also decide to get hurt and disappointed and cynical. It's just the way it is. It's like with children. All children will get away with anything they can get away with. That's who a child is. All children will be honest and good if you expect them to be. Except that we know when we use the word all, we get into trouble. But you will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you treat a child as if a child can't be trusted, you'll get exactly what you ask for. And if you treat a child as if they are a good person, and they are to be trusted, once in a while you'll be disappointed. But you'll get a lot better results treating someone as if you expect them to do what they say they're going to do. This is about you. It's not about the child. It's not about the friend. It's not about the spouse. And it's not about the wrong that was done. When somebody does something really bad to you and causes you a great deal of pain, and you have pain because you're a human being, no one will argue that that person did something that was wrong. But you do have a choice on how you treat the effects of that wrong. Whether you decide to get even, as these friends I talked about. My friend very laughingly said, well, it wouldn't bother me if this happened to him. It would be justice. And he looked at me again that question in his eyes and how does a Buddhist feel about this and I said well that's very sad because if you take joy in the unhappiness of another person then you need to work on yourself a lot but they deserve it yeah they may deserve it but if you take joy in the fact that they got what they deserved you've got the problem the issue is not whether someone that's done something bad gets punishment. The issue is how you react to it. The issue is not whether something bad was done to you. The issue is not whether you were treated poorly. The issue is what are you going to do about it? And that's where the lesson lies. 
And so the question is, what do you want? And Ed Wartz asked me that question, and I had no answer for it, and it still makes me bristle when I hear it, but it's still the question. And it's very much a Buddhist question. What do you want? Forget about what was done to you. Forget about what you did not get. Forget about how unfair life has been. Guess what? Life has been unfair for most people. Because who makes the judgment on whether life's fair? You do. And if you've decided that you're a good person and that you, you know, you've helped, been helpful through life and you take little ducks and put them in the water and you take little kittens and you take them out and you've never done a bad thing to anybody and it's getting kind of old, the fact that everybody dumps on you and life is not fair, well, okay. But that's never the question. The question is not whether life is fair. Life doesn't have a personality. Life doesn't have a will. There is no such thing called life that walks around and is unfair to you. It just happens, as if the wind comes up and blows your roof off, and you want to blame it on somebody. There's nobody to blame it on. The wind came up, and the roof blew off. All we have right there is, you know, I mean, religiously, people gnash their teeth and say, oh my God, why me? Why me? What did I do? The wind came up and blew the roof off. There is no why involved in it. There's only a question when these bad events happen, how are you going to react to it? So if your roof blew off and you came to me and said, why does everything bad happen to me? I would say, well, what is it you want out of life? What do you actually want? And if you said to me, well, I didn't want my roof to blow off. I said, well, that's already happened. Now that your roof's blown off, what do you want out of life? What do you want? Well, I want to be able to sit in my house without the rain coming on me. And I'd say, well, then go build the damn roof and put it back on your house and stop complaining. And if you get up and you put a roof on your house, by the time you're done, you'll stop feeling sorry for yourself because it's kind of hard to put a roof on your house and not be involved in the roofing. And now you can sit in your house and you can be proud. You can tell people, hey, I did that roof. Isn't that neat? I never thought I could do that. So the question is always, what do you want? It's a good question. Even if it does make me a little uncomfortable, it's a good question. What do you want? If you want to be happy, stop being angry. But they deserve it. Okay, fine. Now, do you want to be happy or do you want to try to be some kind of person that mets out judgment? Leave that to the court system. If somebody's a bad person and they need to go to jail, let the court send them to jail. But you don't need to walk around being angry at them all the time. You can just let go of it. And in Buddhism, what we want is to be happy. That's all. It's real simple, to be happy. And sometimes to be happy is to actually learn how to forgive people. And sometimes to be happy is just to accept the fact that people do things and life does things that are not fun. And so we just move on. And sometimes to be happy is to realize that all this stuff happened, but look, there's still a sunset. When I get up in the morning, there's the refrigerator still works so I can have my coffee. Sometimes that's all there is. But you know, life is simple. You have a little bit to eat. You have a dry place to sleep. You have one or two friends that you can laugh with. Life is good. All the rest is extra. So what do you want? I hope to be happy. Not to get revenge. Not to see someone get their punishment. Not to get even. Not to be cynical. Not to be bitter. Because I don't want any of that. I just want to get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee and look out the window and see the mountain. And that's pretty good when it happens. But it all comes back to you. It's always your choice, this what do you want. And you've got to give up stuff. And the way we do that is through meditation. Meditation will teach you to put down anything you need to put down. It's a powerful tool for learning how to put things down.